Hello, everyone. Welcome to MHTV. We're really pleased to have you with us tonight. We've got a really interesting... Um, we're going to be talking about a few subjects tonight. We're going to be talking about politics and mental health and COVID. And we'll be moving around those topics. And we'd love to hear what you have to say. So before I introduce you to our fantastic guest, let me go over to Dave and he can tell you how you can join in tonight. Dave? Uh, yeah, thanks, Nikki. So as always, we've got the two ways to join in. The first is on Facebook Live. Obviously, you're watching it. Just head over towards the right. Uh, there is the place where you can type in your comments, questions, and we'll try and bring any of those in that we can tonight. Uh, and then the other option is over on X. Uh, all you need to do is make sure that any Xs that you post uh, uh, include the hashtag MHTV. I'll be keeping an eye out for that, and I'll again bring anything in that we can. But without further ado, straight back to Nikki. Absolutely. We're really, really fortunate to be joined by a um, fantastic guest tonight, Dr. Luca Bernardi. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. Hi, Nikki and David. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation. And, and hi to everyone who's watching this, because I cannot see you, but you can see me, which is really unfair. <laughs> I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool. I'm a political scientist. Uh, and uh, now it's been a good maybe seven years or so that I've been doing research on how people with mental health problems engage in politics. Mm. And uh, uh, we've done uh, quite some work on depression, especially. And then obviously mm -hmm. COVID started, and so it was interesting to have a look at how COVID obviously affected people's mental health and in turn their political engagement. Mm -hmm. And so interesting research because there's so many people who experience mental health problems mm -hmm. and uh, we don't know much about how whether they're represented in politics and how do they engage in politics, how do they perceive politics and, mm -hmm. and how do they behave in politics. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so there's mm -hmm. really a lot that we should know about this group. Yeah. Absolutely. And from a nursing perspective, obviously, the point of nursing is to help people live as well as they can under sometimes very difficult circumstances and to engage with all forms of life. And that does include political life as well, because obviously mental health services are frequently embattled and defended and things like that. So it's very natural that both staff and people who use those services may want to express themselves politically, may want to organise and form. And so it's very important for people who are in this um, field to understand you know, perhaps some of the cutting edge research, which we're going to look at today, but also just reminding people of their professional responsibilities, which is it's absolutely fine to discuss things like uh, politics and um, voting and things like that. We're going to come up for a bumper year for voting. There's so many elections coming up in the next 12 months. It's it it's a bizarre time. So I would imagine feelings are going to be running pretty high. Um, just just I'm just guessing that things are going to be um, uh, quite extreme. So of course, you can discuss this because it'll be part of our public life. But remember that you cannot influence somebody around um, uh, a voting. Um, you can tell people how to vote and you can support people, particularly people without um, registered addresses and things like that. There's lots of ways that they can engage in their um, civic processes. But just to just to balance that while we're talking about these things, you do need to bear in mind your kind of professional registrations as well. So without sort of going too far down that road, let's go back to, to Luca. And, and can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in this field, how you made the connection between the, the subjects. Yeah, so uh, uh, pretty much when I was free uh, from my PhD, which took a few years time, <laughs> and uh, it, it was more about uh, how governments respond to public opinion, to the people. And so uh, I'm still interested in, uh, in representation, in political representation and, and how people are represented in policy. But uh, I shifted towards mental health uh, yeah. for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is actually personal because uh, I experienced depression myself yeah. uh, in, in various occasions in the past. And uh, so it was also very useful for me to uh, uh, sort of understand how my, how my mm -hmm. mind works and, and maybe works in similar ways for other people as well. And so maybe I understanding how I might behave, I would probably be better uh, in a better position to understand many other people. Uh, who might experience similar situations, although we know that there are so many types of depression, so they want to generalize that. But yeah, and and then I have the actually luxury of uh, having a father who is a neurologist and pharmacologist. Yeah. So it was nice to chat about these things in the house and say, okay, well, what do you think about voting and mental health? What do you think about, uh, yeah, political participation or these sort of things? And so, uh, 
it, it was also sort of a, an inspiration. And then when I actually looked into the literature in my field in, in politics, <laughs> there was almost nothing. And I was surprised because yeah. many other uh, groups have been, uh, we've been, political scientists have been doing a lot of research on many other groups, uh, under underrepresented groups. But yeah. uh, uh, people with uh, disabled people, for instance, or people with mental health problems, were sort of uh, left behind in, in, in the field. And uh, well, it all started because uh, we found that uh, uh, people with depression tend to vote less. And so this probably, uh, and, and in general, people in poor health, uh, whether this yeah. is physical or, 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 or non-physical or, or mental. And, uh, um, and so we, we wanted to understand why this is the case and what are the mechanisms. So I can explain this uh, health voting gap or mental mm -hmm mental health footing up more specifically yeah. Yeah. and it's really... this is how it started mm. Yeah. Mm, thank you that's it is really interesting is i think because when people start to research you know their their interests their sort of personal experiences their sort of academic skills all sorts of turn into this strange kind of whirlpool that then pops out it's a topic that, that they really focus on so what have you found how have you found that mental health diagnosis impacts or correlates alongside political views what have you noticed Okay, so what, so what we've done so far with um, myself and, and other colleagues who are working with me, uh, so the, the sort of first thing that we try to map is pretty much to understand, right, uh, why depressed people would vote less, uh, uh, knowing that there was this, this gap that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. and, and some of these has to do with, uh, we found out it has to do with uh, what we call political efficacy. So... Uh, not just about your under, your own understanding of what's going on in politics, but also uh, your uh, feelings of representation. So uh, uh, whether you think the system is uh, is giving a damn of somebody like you, yeah. right? That's, that was the main point, right? And what was interesting to find is that uh, although depressed people uh, have a lower internal political efficacy, meaning they, they have uh, left less self-confidence in understanding politics and they also have a lower external political efficacy which is these feelings of being represented by the system what actually was driving uh, 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 voting or or better the, the this voting gap was actually the external one so uh, uh, you're this feeling of of not being much represented by the system and similarly uh, we, we found similar things when we look at trust in government so uh, depressed people have a lower trust in government mm. where they tend to evaluate political uh, objects more negatively in general. Mm. So think about uh, democracy, think about the economy mm. uh, uh, or think about health services or yeah. education services again. And, and these findings are actually uh, not just in the UK, they are, they are kind of uh, generalizable a bit uh, across, across Europe. Mm. And, and Yes, and and so what I what I tried then to understand is I'm really fascinated by uh, by the way we think, and so uh, uh, I was uh, I was really fascinated by the literature on on cognitive aspects of depression. So yeah. think about uh, if whoever is listening to to, to us, think about whether yeah. you, you you've been also ruminating about your problems. And all this negative material that gets stuck in your mind and it doesn't go mm. away easily. Or think mm. about negativity biases. So maybe you interpret information from the environment in a more negative way, or maybe you just uh, you tend to attend more to negative information, or maybe to recall more negative information. So this sort of a uh, the way we cope and and the way we regulate our emotions yeah. and and these negativity biases actually played a role in 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 explaining uh, why for instance people with depression would have more negative views of of of, of the system for instance mm -hmm. or 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 having a lower internal political efficacy so self confidence mm -hmm. in politics again mm -hmm. and uh, but what was interesting for instance is that uh, political interest, uh, uh, it wasn't uh, diminished by depression. So there's mm. something interesting there because uh, uh, it's not that depressed people, they just lose interest. In, uh, obviously, if, uh, anhedonia, right, is one of the yeah. key symptoms of depression. But nevertheless, yeah. uh, probably because people are, are socialized in politics, uh, some things maybe just 
stay with us and 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 probably to I guess it's, let's say that you are depressed in your home. Maybe you, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't necessarily stop watching the news or something like that. Yeah. So we, we didn't find much of an evidence that actually depression uh, decreases people's political interests. It might be interesting actually uh, to, to study whether, uh, and this is something that we want to do, uh, whether this is related to news avoidance. Maybe mm -hmm. we want to avoid negative news well, well. as much as we can. <laughs> yeah. It'd be interesting as well, I think, with the way that politics has gone and with, with the experience that a lot of people had in COVID, a lot of people did start to limit their um, exposure to news because it was so difficult all the time. Whether there's actually going to end up being a huge amount of difference between the general population and people who have a diagnosis of depression, because people are all sort of in that sort of strange or on that continuum at the moment, which is really interesting as well. As well. Did you look into, you know, the number of politicians that have actually disclosed mental distress because I can only think of a few people in politics so Steve Baker talked about having mental health issues <clears throat> other people I think Rory Stewart, Rory Stewart has talked about going for counselling and um, obviously people like politic adjacent like Alistair Campbell have quite sort of famous sort of discussions around mental well-being and he's quite a champion but I can't think of that many politicians who actually talk about accessing services, managing stress. Uh, and I wonder if that makes a difference. You're saying, you know, people don't feel represented. Is it that they don't see politicians as representative or is it they, they don't access politics as representative? Right. Could you clarify that a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've done a little bit of research on on, mm. on on how people perceive politicians with mental health mm -hmm. problems. And, and that was fascinating because what we knew... Uh, there wasn't much work on that. There was something. Uh, there was yeah. a study actually that was conducted a few years ago in the U.S. and in Canada by some colleagues, and they yeah. found that uh, politicians with uh, depression would be penalized, uh, electorally speaking. Yeah. And uh, and so we wanted to see what's going on in the U.K. and and if it's still the case, mm -hmm. maybe. And so we we did a survey experiment. So what we did to to, to put it simply was to show people. Um, who participated in the survey uh, a fake tweet about uh, about uh, a politician who's coming back from a period of leave and so some people will get the tweet with a politician who experienced depression uh, some other group yeah. of people will get uh, the politician who experienced uh, some anxiety uh, disorder and some others uh, bipolar disorder yeah. and uh, but also uh, uh, we know that politics can be a stressful job. And so we asked yeah. those, some, some, some group of people received the, the, the fake politician mm. who, who was on leave for a few months because it was uh, the job was, so, was too stressful. And oh. then we, we also had to compare it with uh, a sort of a normal situation. And so we, uh, we, also, uh, we also had a case of a politician who had a car accident. Mm -hmm. And what, what was interesting, uh, uh, which... Uh, um, which is also very positive in a way, uh, and positive for in terms of results, mm. uh, uh, is that uh, we didn't find any any sort of a, a disadvantage. So uh, politicians with mental health problems were not perceived as uh, less uh, competent in in okay. the uh, in doing their jobs, uh, or uh, actually we found that they were more honest, and uh, mm. uh, and. Uh, and, but also the, the other good characters that a politician, that a good politician yeah. should have. So uh, not just about competence and honesty, but yeah. also whether you are a strong leader. Yeah. Uh, um, and so they, uh, in some occasions, they were actually more likely to, uh, to be perceived in this way, especially yeah. the one with depression, probably because yeah. depression has become perhaps so much common. And, yeah. and, and the people are more uh, maybe indulgent nowadays with this, and then yeah. maybe there's less stigma on depression than in other yeah. problems, perhaps. And uh, was it the but, same for? Did you say you looked at psychosis, or was it bipolar? The other uh, one? Uh, bipolar, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we didn't find that uh, the the sort of a, a fake politician uh, yeah, uh, with yeah. bipolar disorder was penalized in, in in any way. And what was also interesting is that uh, when we asked about uh, the ability to represent. Uh, uh, so, because obviously we are interested in, in, in mm. are you going to be a good representative? And what we found is that again, there was they they, they weren't perceived as as more negatively, but actually uh, there was a positive uh, effect on on 
representing uh, underrepresented yeah. groups, which makes sense. And and actually for for the press for the depressed politician again society as a whole probably because again depression perhaps is so much common or everybody even if it's not clinically we, mm. we uh, can relate to it can't you yeah mm. and the, and and the positive note was that uh, nobody was punished electorally speaking so they people wouldn't say that they would vote less for yeah. these politicians which yeah. is probably good news that's really and, good uh, news and different from previous studies isn't it when you looked at stuff people often spoke about having sort of sympathy with people but then like would you let this person babysit your kid they're like no exactly <laughs> or else they were okay with things that they felt that they had an affinity with or an understanding with like depression and anxiety like oh i get sad i'm worried sometimes even though it's not at all the same thing people felt they had a connection but True, things like but... psychotic episodes were treated quite differently but from what you're saying for serious mental issues like bipolar are being but but it's also fair to say yeah. that uh results were not identical for everyone so for instance mm -hmm. you, you mentioned exactly something related to uh, stigma and prejudice mm -hmm. so obviously the people who uh, uh, for those who stigma is, is, is higher they mm -hmm. would they would see these kind of politicians more negatively so this is this is uh, important to, to to remember yeah but, uh, it's interesting though isn't it? Yes. it does feel that society is changing and maybe as well, because our politicians have, have been, particularly in the UK, been seen as quite privileged for a little while, that actually people feel they can relate to someone who's overcome adversity a bit. So like someone who's coming back from a car accident, someone who's been ill for whatever reason, people can feel like they're a little bit more connected to that experience, maybe. Yeah, and the, the, the good thing is that, uh, uh, so some very good colleagues are studying disability and, and uh, so the same situation with disabled uh, yeah. politicians. Yeah. And and some of these, uh, we, they found similar results as well. So yeah. that's also very uh, going in this direction. And But even uh, uh, when talking to colleagues about these results, uh, uh, someone said, oh, yeah, actually, it's going on the same thing with gender. So maybe yeah. it's, it's we're becoming probably in general more, more tolerant, hopefully. Uh, Don't tell me you're accidentally giving good news to everybody, Luca. <laughs> in the UK, at least. <laughs> and so we need to find out whether this is UK specific yeah. or uh yeah which is uh or, or is in general something that yeah. something that is happening in, in, in public opinion uh, uh more widely speaking. yeah so we've been thinking about how sort of, sort of diagnosis expects uh, impacts people's um political perceptions attitudes decision making does it impact people's um, mental health more broadly improve or worsen is that something you've looked at yet so how do I, uh, ask me the question again? So would a sure. diagnosis would impact people's mental health? No, no. so we, I was saying we've, we've talked about, um, you know, political perceptions and attitudes. And I was wondering how, politi how politics itself oh, okay. um, affects people's mental health. Right. So this is mm. an, something understudied again. And mm. uh, now the, we're trying to do some, some work on this and... Mm. And again, I think that the results would might depend on uh, on on the people we're looking at. Yeah. Uh, so the idea would be that probably people who are much more into politics, and uh, so people who are, for instance, they identify with a political party, mm -hmm. or they're really interested in politics, pay a lot of attention to politics. Those kind of people would uh, uh, maybe politics doesn't act as a as a stress factor in a negative way, but actually might mobilize them more. Yeah. And but for pe for other people that instead uh, uh, instead I don't really maybe much more into politics there might be yeah. uh, uh, I, I believe that this is where we might find this sort of a negative effects on of politics as a potential stress factor. I wouldn't be and, surprised because you have like that correlation, don't you, between people who are um, who have to really manage their health if they're going to be full time activists, because you know politics as it is now is quite rough and tumble. Like I, I can remember, and maybe I'm just looking back into my, my youth, but I remember politics being quite boring and you could like leave it for a couple of weeks and it would be where you left it. Whereas now it feels like 24 hours has gone past and all bets are off. You know, it's, it's a very, it feels like a very different experience now. And you do see some people who are almost kind of addicted to that kind of political mayhem. And because we have social media, which kind of interprets and channels it, and we have lots of um, podcasts and things where people really, discuss this sort of issue and they have quite quite um 
engaged conversations about it and the kind of social media melee i wonder if actually it's not just politics anymore it's actually identity it's actually lots of other things community that it's forming as well and sort of like um single issue politics as well seems to be much higher up than it used to be so maybe less political engagement in terms of formal parties mm-hmm. they might that might i i imagine that political parties have older people joined still and less maybe younger people but i might be wrong about that Oh, yeah. I think the, the identity uh, aspect that you raised is, is mm. important. Um, mm. For instance, when we look into, uh, uh, think about affective polarization, so how people from different camps hate each other. Mm. Uh, again, mm. for those ones who are more into politics, it would actually boost their mental health. It's like probably going to the, I don't know, to a football match between, mm. I don't know, Everton mm. and Liverpool. Yeah, so gamifying little, it. Uh, but for other people, uh, it, it actually might be less. Yeah, I guess it's going to depend. Uh, isn't it? Less positive. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be yeah. very interested to see um, how that um, how that transpires. So obviously, Dave's um, putting out links as we go um, of, of some of your work where people can look at it, but also um, your website as well, so that as things come online and change, um, people will be able to to check there. So let's, because our time's ticking on, let's let's think a little bit about kind of the impact of COVID, which has sort of driven a yeah. bus through everything, hasn't it? All the things we thought. So tell us how, how COVID has impacted the work that you've been doing. Right. So uh, so what I've been doing was to try to uh, survey the British public uh, since the beginning of the pandemic and uh, sort of try to understand how COVID, uh, sort of the anxieties that people uh, sort of get in relation to COVID or COVID as a uh, as a stress factor. So mm-hmm. think about uh, obviously the um, um, uh, well uh, policy decisions, uh, lockdown, and these kind of things. Yeah. And so how these things might uh, so by anxieties about COVID, I mean uh, people who were worried, obviously, to catch COVID and and, yeah. and potentially compromised. Yeah, yeah, and potentially yeah. die or mm-hmm. that they're that it would happen the same thing to their family and friends yeah. or that the financial situation will be compromised or even think about it as a sense of hopelessness for the future. I mean, how long are we going to deal with this problem, right, in, in, in society? Yeah. For And uh, um, so uh, pretty much, so at the beginning of the pandemic, you might have heard of this uh, these effects that, that, that the scholars have found it okay, there's something new, there's a, there's an external shock coming, like a pandemic in this case, and people uh, are sort of a, this rally around the flag effect. So uh, uh, people turn to politicians and to, uh, to representatives to, to find some, some comfort. And uh, so maybe uh, we can find even a boost in trust in politics and so on. But then uh, yes. uh, when we moved uh, along during the pandemic, actually this mm-hmm. disappeared. And, yes, I remember. <laughs> and, and COVID anxieties had a negative effect on, on trust in government mm. and, and evaluation of government pers- performance on COVID. Yeah. And when we looked into uh, symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress, all these things actually uh, impacted negatively, uh, uh, yeah, how people perceive political objects. Mm. And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, in general, negative effects, I mm. would say doesn't surprise me so people were still interested but they felt very much left behind is that what what your work is suggesting yes but uh, mm. but also different uh, sort of different factors matters in different ways mm. and and even when it comes to political participation mm. and 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 mental health for instance uh, or even what well, actually in covid anxieties as well so what we find mm. for instance is that uh, there might be uh, some mobilizing effect there. So in some political uh, activities that we can take uh, well, during the pandemic from home, yeah. for instance, there was yeah. actually uh, a rise uh, yeah. of those forms of participation. Like yeah. think about, uh, I don't know, sign, signing an online petition yeah. or, uh, or obviously social media uh, um, stuff. So uh, co- talking about politics and social media or even getting in touch with politicians. And um, mm. we, we found a, a sort of a positive effect there on uh, on political, on those kind of forms of political participation. And the interesting thing was that um, independently of COVID, 
this is something similar with some mental health problems as well because it what it's, yeah. it's more complicated it's not just about a negative effect right that if you have a mental health problem this would be a terrible thing for your participation for your political engagement that's actually not the case uh, um, this this voting gap doesn't happen everywhere so and and uh, and sometimes actually there might be a, a sort of a mobilizing effect and but this is not new to people who studied uh, disabled people yeah. and, uh, so think about uh, or, or people who have uh, chronic health conditions like i don't know a cancer uh, um, there's a much more uh, sort of a, a this group identity there and networking mm. and so all these kind of things that might uh, mobilize people into action and mm. we find something similar a little bit with with, with, with some mental health problems at least with yeah. depression and anxiety for sure, sure. Uh, yeah. and and this is yeah this is promising i think are you ready for some questions they're starting to come in for sure, for sure. <laughs> i i can't I can hopefully i will be able to answer them i can't tell you what people actually mean but okay let's go for it okay so my, my first the first one which is I think probably my favourite so far, and okay. that's from the first year. Says, um, "Do different diagnoses make you vote for different parties?" <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's going to get you in a world of trouble. Go ahead, Luca. <laughs> we don't know this yet. Uh, <laughs> the, the only thing that I can tell you is that uh, I'm not talking. Well, I, I can actually tell you about some. Yeah, I can tell you about diagnosis as well. But but mm. for the for depression, uh, so because we looked into both symptoms of depression and. Yeah and clinical diagnosis so pretty much in surveys mm. so that what we can find out is whether uh, if someone tells you yeah. yes i've been diagnosed uh, with, with depression or not yeah. and and that's all we know uh, uh, so unfortunately we don't know much about the history of the of the person oh. and of a family history of mental health problems for instance or this kind of thing. we don't know anything about that but uh, yeah but what's interesting is that there's uh, so on average let's say uh, there's definitely something going on between uh, being more on the left hand side of the political spectrum and mm -hmm. uh, and being more depressed. So I'm not sure what was the causal effects. <laughs> what the yeah. causal I think effects. everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's interesting because another person has asked, is this yeah. to do with mental health issues or is it to do with having restricted incomes, which is interesting. So suppose, and I can see what what they what they're suggesting is this idea that if you are struggling to have long-term full-time employment or you're on benefits or something like that is that going to skew your political thinking or lead you to think probably more? yeah so how yeah, do you yeah. differentiate is what they were asking oh well we uh we haven't done this analysis yet but we mm -hmm. can definitely look into uh because there are there are questions about income or your occupation and and yeah so we'd we definitely have to go much more beyond the, the mm. mean findings mm. because yeah, as you say, yeah, it can matter differently for, we have, I think we haven't found much of a difference in terms of age yeah. uh, 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 or gender, uh, but, uh, but for other, uh, other maybe socio, socio demographic factors. Yeah, yeah. There might be something interesting going on there. Yeah. That makes me wonder about, um, you know, cause you're saying people are still interested, but they're not, necessarily the, it maybe is impacting people's voting behavior i wonder if that could be something that's more societal as well and that actually people are engaging in politics in different ways now because you you mentioned like the rise of the online petition so i would say that someone who who goes on a march or somebody who signs an online petition or is part of a pressure group or, you know online or part of a um well even things like the blooming national trust became political this year didn't it so there's that that to me is political activity so how are you defining political engagement is it just by voting intention no 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 uh, mm. uh, so there are the the surveys that um, myself uh, uh, and and but even surveys that are available uh, mm. and everybody can can use uh, mm. from uh, from other european countries they ask about different forms of participation so uh, they usually ask about uh, what are you so what have you done in in the last year so did you contact a politician yes or no and you say yes if you did it or no if you didn't do it and uh, and then they ask you whether you uh, exactly you uh, i don't know you participated in a in a in an election campaign mm. or whether you uh, uh yeah you actually uh, participated in a political party so you have mm. uh, or or in in or in another association mm or whether you uh, did some protest 
and yeah, yeah online petition or uh, social media uh, posting okay. posting yeah. about politics and social media. Uh, these are uh, I think boycotting a product was also another oh, activity that yeah. yeah but pretty much we have these uh, seven or eight forms of participation mm. that we can look at and what was interesting actually when uh, when uh, myself and and Joe Dr. Joe Daniels from the University of Bath and yeah. the the old party parliamentary group on, on, on vulnerable groups to pandemics so we did a we 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 are doing a work, some work together. And what was interesting was that actually people who are Im immunocompromised uh, uh, tended to participate more on these kind of forms of participation that you can take from home. Mm. And uh, and obviously the pandemic was uh, was terrible for them and mm. in terms of anxieties, but in terms Definitely. of also mental health problems compared to the general public. And uh, but hopefully uh, uh, sort of MPs are are doing something and. Uh, for for making the conditions of the of these people better so we, we're trying to help on this do you think politicians actually have started to think about because obviously now they're trying to get votes they're like dividing everybody up into groups of like who they can influence and <laughs> do you think there's actually um a willingness on their behalf to actually engage with these populations so populations of people who have long-term health um issues or other types of disability no i think that there are two issues change? There are two issues here. So we know that mental health is not a policy issue that makes you win or lose the elections because it's not, in, in comparison to other policy issues, yeah. it's not terribly salient. Mm. But, it, but it's obviously important for, for groups of people. Uh, think about family of, families of people who have mental health problems or people with mental health problems themselves. And uh, so it might be very important for some people, but not for everyone, unfortunately. And... Mm. Uh, but it's fair to say that, for instance, the, the attention that uh, uh, parties have been paying uh, uh, to mental health uh, increased in the in the past uh, in the past few years. In, so, if you have a look at the manifestos, so this oh. is something that uh, some work that Danny Bauman, my, <laughs> my PhD student, mm -hmm. uh, is doing, and uh, you can really see from his work that the attention on mental health increased in the. Uh, in, in parties' manifestos, uh, for instance, from 2010 onwards. Mm. And so on the one hand, there is more attention, but it still is not really a, a, an issue that makes you win the elections. Mm. And on the other hand, I think that the, the problem will be when, when politicians really realize that uh, they could use uh, uh, these people for, uh, for uh, gaining uh, electoral mm. uh, rewards. And uh, uh, so this is an open question because we, uh, yeah. as I said, we're doing some work with a non-party parliamentary group, but, uh, but as you probably know, these are uh, groups that are uh, really interesting to work with because they have, uh, for instance, a, um, an MP from one party and a yeah. North from another party. Mixed so they, yeah. they work together to, to yeah. solve a, a, a problem. Yeah. And so that's different from obviously uh, being a political party yeah. and having goals, whether this yeah. is getting to government or gaining mm. votes, mm. but hopefully, uh, at least if 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 this can help in terms of policy representation, might not necessarily be a bad thing. Mm, absolutely, uh, Dave. Is there anything you want to? Do? You're the resident political animal. Is there anything that you wanted to ask? <laughs> uh, I suppose it's interesting when when you say that, Nikki, because I kind of feel like. Again, my interest in politics has taken a bit of a hit, which is funny, really, considering the job that I do, but kind of feeling slightly frustrated with where we are politically at the moment and really kind of hoping to get some of that hope back. Mm. Uh, and, and I suppose that's a that's an interesting place for me to be in personally. Mm. Uh, I think one, yeah, I've been thinking about a few of the things that, as you've been chatting away. One of them is when you mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, the number of politicians coming forward to talk about their own mental health. Yeah. I think what's been interesting recently is there's been a number of politicians saying that they're going to come out of politics because of the mental health. So we had, uh, for example, Justinda Ardern uh, in New Zealand. Uh, we had Nicola Sturgeon in, in Scotland kind of talking about how you know, politics wasn't a good place to have 
you know, for, for your for your mental health, and and there needs to be a time when you kind of say is enough is enough. So I, I kind of was, have been thinking about that as as you've been speaking. Mm. I, th I think the other thing that is interesting is the bit about actually, and, and maybe a, a question for Luca is how much are politicians incentivize to disincentivize people not to vote. So you know, thinking about actually, okay. you know. For example, over the you know since 2010, we've had massive cuts to mental health services. So, is it in there? In you know, is, is there an incentive for them to make it harder for people with uh, mental health conditions to not vote? And thinking, for example, about some of the things that they've done to achieve that, you know, that you've got to take ID to uh, vote now. Uh, that you've got to register, you know, that the process of registering to vote is more complicated than it used to be. Uh, if they were genuinely wanting people with uh, long-term mental health conditions, for example, to vote, wouldn't they make the process of voting a much easier one? So I, I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that one. No, it's interesting because, yeah, it, we there was something going on as well with uh, disabled people. Mm. And uh, so it's not only... Uh, uh, just a, a, a potential problem for people with mental health problems. It's 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 a broader problem for sure. And I think yeah, I think it's related definitely to the resources that are located. Uh, I know that there's a huge burden of uh, of mental health problems, uh, and and obviously pharmaceutical treatment costs much more yeah. uh, than other sort of. Uh, uh, ways to uh to uh, to other, other other interventions mm. and so if politicians was obviously if they want to uh keep costs low there will definitely be uh, uh potentially this effect also that you mentioned david uh mm. that might have uh, maybe unintentional effects on voting uh, i suppose it makes sense doesn't it? in the same way that you try and target people who you think will vote for you, that you wouldn't necessarily invest time in people who you think maybe won't vote for you. It makes sense, yeah. doesn't it? But I, I suppose it's actual, you know, effort put in to make it harder. You know, it's not even we're not going to be interested or we're not going to make it easy, mm -hmm. but we're actually going to put blocks in place. Uh, and I think another uh, example of that is obviously the, the number of people that are in prison that have uh, poor mental health. Uh, and and actually, you know, there's there's a legal, uh, you know, there's, there's there's a legal system that stops them from voting. You know that that they've not got the legal right to vote, which which also is fascinating. Uh, mm. One of the things I just wanted to say is Centre for Mental Health at the moment are doing a piece of uh, a, a piece of work looking at the uh, barriers for people with mental health difficulties from voting, uh, and they've got a survey that's happened. So I think the 11th of March. So I would encourage people that, you know, have experience to, uh, you know, to complete that uh, and be involved in the work that they're doing. Because, you know, the, I think the Centre for Mental Health have done some great things in the past, uh, yeah. trying to make sure that, you know, people are uh, not disenfranchised. Mm. Yeah, we've retweeted that. That's out there, guys. So do have a look at that and share it. Thank you. Um, we, we Time is marching on again. So can we just look, look at what's coming up for you, where you think this area is heading and what kind of studies you'd like to be engaged in? Yeah, so, well, there's a lot to do here. We just started mm. a few years ago, so there's really a lot of research to be doing. Um, mm. So some of these has to deal with, uh, yeah, the representation of people with mental health problems, because now we've been digging a little bit into, uh, yeah, um, attitudes of people uh, or how people perceive politics and, and voting. But uh, do all these things actually uh, imply uh, uh, an under-representation or some misrepresentation in policy? And it's, that, that will be the next step that, we, uh, mm. uh, uh, that we, we, we're tackling. And then much of the work uh, uh, that has been conducted has been conducted on depression. So mm. we also want to see what's going on with other uh, mental health problems. We, yeah. we started doing this a little bit, uh, uh, but there's... Uh, yeah, there's definitely much more to be doing there. And as you said before, yeah, politics has a potential stress factor for some people. Again, <laughs> a say. lot of work to do here. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, I think that that I, I really look forward to seeing the work that you get engaged in, Lucas. 
as you say, it's the looking start forward of, to conducting it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just the, you're just absolutely at the start of looking at this issue, and uh, and it's such an interesting time to be doing that. So before we finish up, is there anything that you'd like to leave the audience with? Is anything any way that they can get engaged or anything they can read or be involved in? No, probably as a not to finish on a negative note, but maybe to finish on a positive note. Uh, Try. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll probably say, yeah, when it comes to, yeah, as we said, uh, when it comes to political participation, not everything is negative. So oh. it's, it's, it's definitely something good. And oh. then uh, I was thinking, uh, you mentioned at some point during the, the, the discussion about, for instance, decision making, right? And uh, uh, s some interesting work that has been done in, uh, in 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 sort of cognitive aspects of depression was looking at depressive realism yeah. so uh, there's actually also two ways of looking at this right is it about negativity biases or actually is is about being more realistic in the yeah. way we see things and yeah. actually uh, that, that might not be a a, a bad thing either and mm -hmm. then i'm glad that uh, the appg group is is is, uh, is doing work with uh, for immunocompromised people so yeah. that uh, I mean, it's early to say uh, what will be the outcome, but there's definitely something moving, and and hopefully things will be uh, will be better for for it's one point two million people in the UK, so it's yeah. uh, it's a lot of people, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Before we go, Dave, is there anything that you wanted to say about Monday or coming up next week? Yes, not not me Monday, but the day Monday. Uh, we're doing something unusual on Monday, me and you, yourself, Nikki, aren't we? Uh, just to announce it here. Uh, we're doing an, another, a, another edition of MHCV. It'll be episode 155. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're going to be joined by uh, a couple of uh, special guests, uh, Andrea Sutcliffe uh, and Ecosia Nainen uh, from NHS England, uh, where we will be talking to them uh, in advance of the next day's uh, mental health nursing symposium event that at Unite we're supporting NHS England with. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we another opportunity to have a conversation with some important people in mental health nursing, uh, and hopefully that'll be a, a good a good opportunity for that. Uh, and also, excitingly for us too, Nikki, we're, we'll actually be in the same room to perform that uh, interview won't we so uh, uh that'll be yeah. something different for us <laughs> yeah so thank you very much for for watching and for being involved tonight i hope you found some things in this that have been interesting to you um and it only bids us um to say thank you once again to luca for his um kind donation of his time and to say good night to you all take care no night all <laughs>